good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Mythgard in Middle-Earth. My name is Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, joined as always by my friend Grifflet, who is looking out across the waste. Yes, it is Wasteful Wanderings, episode number two. And uh, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to continuing to explore as we finally got to Dire Lad last time after many tantalizing near misses uh, when we kept getting sent on Ithilien quests. But now we are firmly entrenched here in Dire Lad and we are ready to go. Um, okay, so I'm trying to remember what I was doing. I was just about to go and return quests, as I recall. Hang on a second. I think I might have just done something. There we go. Apologies. Apologies for the brief blank screen there. I was uh, I was trying to make Grifflet move, and I uh, was accidentally still on my OBS, and therefore changed the scene. I think. Okay. Anyway, here we are. Um, <clears throat> so, what is that body of water? Oh, right. I'm looking down on the edges of the dead marshes. That makes sense. You know, I wish I could reduce the size of this thing. I've wished that so many times. But, okay. Anyway. Alright, so I had just finished finding, uh, doing the archaeology, as I recall. I've got that one scouting to do, right there, I think. And then, oh no, I haven't finished the artifacts, that's right. I got the, all of the artifacts that were in this spot. That's what I remember finishing. And I have found not the first hint of where Troll Strife is to be found, nor do I indeed see any indication on the map to give me any hints. So we'll just carry on looking for that. But first we get out of here and we go south. Okay. Bye, everybody. I mean, orcs. Okay, let's see. Can I get up there? Yeah. Let's go up here. All right. Good to see everybody today. I am uh, excited about um, uh, Mythmoot next week. Next week, next week is Mythmoot. It's the uh, biggest event of the year for Signum University. Um, very many of us are gathering in uh, Leesburg, Virginia, not far out of DC. So I won't be here next week. I'll be I'll be there. Ah, there's one of the towers of the teeth, and here is that. Uh, uh, what's it called? Hyrondir. Yeah. Okay. So that's where I'm headed eventually, but I got to go this way, and. Uh, find that scouting spot. Okay. I, it must be on that little hill right there. They've all been high places and they've all had orcs in them. So we'll see. I'm expecting to find uh, some kind of orcish uh, watcher sitting up here. Uh-huh. Just as I suspected. Okay. So... Did I finish it? Scouting the Blight. So complete the quest, Culling the Blighted, and Creatures of the Mire. I already did have completed both of those, so ready to turn those in. Excellent. Whoa. Hey, come on now. I completed them. Why are you polluting my map with all that purple? Okay. So I think I'm ready. Other than the troll strife, as I say, which as I have no leads on, I'm not going to worry about too much. So I do need more artifacts. Tell you what, why don't I do those? And Because I probably will have to return to Amir down here, and then I can do all those returnings all in one shot. So let me go down into the... Uh, I bet you in these outskirty ruins is where there's a lot of them. So let's go. Uh, let's go check that out. Meanwhile, let's um, 
Let's do a lore question. So, by the way, um, <clears throat> at MythMood, one of the uh, a traditional event at MythMood that I've been doing for many years now with uh, Valori and Druid's Fire is I do a little Lotro, a, spe a special live from MythMoot Lotro stream with a lot in front of a live studio audience, um, which is always a lot of fun and has me looking in multiple directions as I'm trying to uh, uh, both like stream and address you guys while also um, uh, talking to the live audience that's there. So that'll be that'll be interesting and fun and challenging as it always is. Um, but um, what I try usually to do something there that I've never done before. Um, and I've decided that what I'm going to do this year in this year's Myth, Gar Myth Moot Lo uh, uh, Lotro stream is I'm going to do... Uh, sightseeing in Umbar. I've never been to Umbar. I I, I, I don't even have a character that high level. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna look around and see what I see and introduce folks who don't know the game to their Umbar. There, I think that should be that should be great fun. So I'm not gonna be necessarily. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to be questing because I'm not going to be high enough level for the quests. But I'll probably take Wigand to uh, be least likely to accidentally die. But um, but in any case, yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> the Wigand Marathon is a totally separate event. Um this is not a marathon event uh, at Mythmoot. It'll be probably a couple hours, but um, it's uh, it's not really able to be much longer than that. Oh, hi. Um, so yeah, Wigan wouldn't be able to make enough progress to be able to like get anywhere significant. I mean, I know he's near uh, I mean, he's in uh, on the cusp of Minas Morgul, which is cool. But I don't want to just do random questing there because I, I, I want it to be a little bit more high yield than that. Um, and uh, and, there's, and there's not enough time, as I say, to do whole storylines and things. So anyway, that's the plan. That's the plan. I'm really excited to uh, to get to see Umbar. And explore a little bit, and in particular, my interest uh, is going to be. Um, I'm going to be doing more, uh, less story investigation, um, as I tend to do here on Grifflet, and more in the direction of, um, you know, archeo gaming, basically. Because, hooray! I did Amir's archaeology. And I was right. I have to go back to the camp to turn that in. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna my my primary interest is going to be exploring how they have depicted and treated Umbar, and what we can see from it, what we can what what we can learn from it. Um, I'm, I think that's gonna be that's gonna be really interesting. Um, it's so fascinating to me. I love, I have always found it extremely rewarding to look carefully at the landscape and the depiction of like cities and places uh, within Lotro and see what kinds of adaptation decisions lie behind uh, what they put there. Like for instance, the way in which I have, um, you know, in my Tuesday night Lotro field trips in exploring the Lord of the Rings, gone through almost all of Eriador, and within Eriador you can see how they have implanted um, and really they've made some really interesting interpretive choices 
to show how they how the Lotro developers understand the development of the entire history of Arnor and of the Arnorian civil wars. That's not a story that they've ever told, of course. Um, not really in detail. It's been alluded to, obviously, but um, uh, but anyway, it's but but you can see it. You can see it in the landscape, and it's uh, I I just I uh, I really admire that. So um, anyway, so that's what I'm really looking forward to because Umbar is a really interesting kind of interpretive adaptation step, right? Um, we know very little about Umbar directly, but we do know some things. And I'm going to be very interested to see how those things are um, enacted uh, in their depictions. So anyway, okay. All right. Hey, Mablung, look, you found my friend. So this was the source of the howling. Ah, Farath, old boy. When you went missing, we thought you were gone for good. Mablung looks closely at the hound. He must have run afoul of those orcish traps. It must have been a lucky scrape, for he is well on he is well on better already. I think we will be on the lookout for those from now on. In truth, I have work for this little ranger. He has taken a liking to you, it seems. Perhaps you would go with him on his rounds in the no man lands? He has rounds? I get Feroth at... Oh, man, that is awesome. Me and the hound dog. Yeah. Awesome, Feroth. <clears throat> I bet you'll be one of the most competent NPCs that I've traveled with ever. Yes, the Cardolan region um, gave us more of the history there, too. Yeah, we just recently did a full uh, uh, exploration uh, on Tuesday nights of Cardolan there. That was really, really fun. Um, yeah, love to see that. Um, oh, man, I'm so excited. I'm so honored to quest with Faroth the Hound. What else you got for me? Oh, oh yeah, I got to actually take the quest. Scouts returning to camp have brought word of orcish... I thought, like, Feroth would give me these quests. Um, word of orcish traps in and among the ruins the entire way between here and Neuharn. Uh, it is one of these that I guess gave Feroth his small wound. He was lucky and nimble. Our marching soldiers may fare far worse if they stumble on them. Take Feroth with you and destroy as many as you can find. If I am not mistaken, he will keep a keen eye and nose out for them now. One of my rangers spotted some number of orcs running across the scrublands, but lost sight of them. There are many ruins throughout the No Man Lands, and I wager that may be where the orcs have gone. Perhaps if you drew close enough, they would come out of hiding. Okay. Now, I noticed last time that there's a uh, there's an explorer deed. So wait, this is Gondor... Uh, where is it? The Wastes. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, I've got a ruins exploration deed, which is like right up my street. Uh, so I'm missing the In the Merchant Shop and Tom Durlan. Unfortunately, now these do show up in, as little flags, right? Yeah, storehouse and such. Okay. Well, we'll see how many of those I find naturally. Oh, man, I've got a ton. I've still got seven more orc camps to find. I am not going out of my way to find forgotten catches, but I'll pick them up if I see them like I just did recently. Okay. i got to say, Mablung has been holding out on us because, like we never saw before that he had a dog. That would have been something. I mean, he's already cool because he's in the book, but uh, seriously. Okay, whom am I hang handing in quests to? So there's... Okay, all right. Uh, Mablung is still showing up with the ring for the howling. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just 
come up here. I've got Amir with his archaeology, his unexpectedly scholarly uh, interests here in Daggerlad. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Griffith. We have precious little from the time of our forefathers. The Aorlingos will fight in our ancestors' name in the great battle to come. Uh, okay, so this will help with morale, you think? Oh, that's it. You got nothing else, huh? That's all you needed. Okay. All right, Gandalf. Did you send me to scout? No. You're sending me to burn the flowers again. I'm good, Gandalf. Thank you. I've already done that. And I'm just going to... Ah, Legolas up there. Legolas sent me this guy. The cursed creatures from the dead marshes will surely spread farther toward Dathelion if given the chance. Thank you for preventing their approach. Uh, well, preventing seems a strong word, but that's fine. It is for the best that these blighted animals are laid to rest. Once the corruption is purged, new life can take hold here. Okay. And, oh, and the scouting. Thank you for your help. It may seem like your efforts mean little, but I have hope that one day, whether we be here to see it or not, this land will return to its original splendor. I agree. I'm all in favor of splendor. Okay. I gotta find Langloss at Hyrondir. Okay. Good. And then just do the uh, second round of uh, quests with my uh, my new friend Faroth here. Look at that, Faroth. See, some NPCs I've been with would have gotten stuck up on that rock. But you, Faroth, I can depend upon. Okay. But I'll tell you what, Faroth. I'm going to mount up. Because I'm going to head off to Hyrondir and turn in. Well, actually, maybe I won't. Because the only one to be turned in there is the epic, which means it's like directing me to there as the next quest center. So let me finish the quests from down here first. I thought I had another one that was going to be turned in up there, but, uh, but it looks like not. So actually, yeah, changing my mind. Okay, let us let's see whose ruin is this? I wonder. Continued culling, really? We have to cull again. I guess I might as well. They're everywhere. Yeah, you didn't realize I had a dog with me this time. Okay, so this is a repeatable, but I haven't done it. Fine. I'll just get it, because I'll probably end up fighting anyway. Does this crawler count? I bet he does. Yeah, he does. All right, what was this? Ah, I found the inn ruins. Nice. <laughs> Thanks for the warning there, Faroth. Yeah, 
this boar was giving me the shifty eye anyway here. Okay. So there's a trap there. Oh. Thank you, Faroth. Well, that did not count as a hidden orc scout. Huh, what do you see? Is there an orc hiding there? I don't know what he's barking at. Oh, is he barking at that guy? Oh, I see the orcs count also in my foes of the No Man Lance. I didn't notice that right away. Okay. I thought there might be more than one orcish trap here. And the map suggests that that is indeed the case. The other one was not hard to find. Hmm. But I'm not seeming to find any, actually. What do you think, Air Faroth? I'm getting nothing down here. Even though my map remains convinced that there are more here. Well, nothing for it. Oh good, Faroth is not in fact aggroing on the... See, he is a clipper NPC. <clears throat> All right, so let's look for traps here, Faroth. We should be able to find something. Yes, Faroth is a good dog. Who's a good dog? Faroth is a good dog. And he tanks for me, too. Okay, is there really one trap per ruin? Oh, no, there's a second one. Wow, that hidden orcish trap was actually hidden. All right, fair enough. Let's see what we find up here. I 
think I've discovered these ruins before. Oh. Hey, sorry, man. I see, so the orchid traps actually are hidden until Farah finds them. <clears throat> I see. I see. How clever. Okay, so I am got six traps now. <clears throat> oh, my dog won't get jealous. She'll just assume I'm talking about her if she hears me talking this way. Okay. Let me... This is clearly going to take some searching. Let me um, get a war question here. All right. Tomas asked, what is the political situation with formerly independent states after Alessar unites both kingdoms after the War of the Ring? The books seem to imply that Bree and the Shire maintain a relative autonomy for municipal matters, but still, far on, but still fall under the jurisdiction of the king's rule. Something close to the northern Italian cities under the Holy Roman Empire. But what about allied kingdoms like Erebor and or the Woodland Realm? They had actual kings in place. Okay, great. Yeah. So it's 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 a little bit unclear, honestly, um, the exact political situation um, in uh, in really in, in all of those places. Um, first of all, I don't see any reason to assume that um, there's a sense, right, in which, especially with the idea of the departure of the firstborn and the, you know, the coming of the dominion of men, especially the, you know, the idea of the dominion of men, there's, um, there's a sort of, we're left with a kind of general implication that, you know, Aragorn is like king of the world, you know, more or less, right, after the War of the Ring. Um, and, um, oh, so these are the hidden orc scouts in question for the, for that quest. I was so busy defeating foes in the nomad. Hey. He can't, what? I'm in a noble's house. That was a hidden orc. Why did not that count? Unless I was at zero, but I thought I was at one. Oh well. Anyway, like as I say, th there's um there's a general sense that um, Aragorn's king of everything, right? But I don't believe that to be true. And I certainly don't think that he would um, be asserting any sort of sovereignty over like Erebor or the Woodland Realm, for instance. Um, So yeah, so that there I don't that I don't think is truly relevant to the sovereignty question. Because I don't um what we're told is that he restores the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor like within their ancient bounds, but th not that he's expanding. Right? Um so yeah, yeah. Oh look. It's another ranger catch. Huh, there's still... Oh, 
there's still a hidden orc around here. There he is. Um, okay. So, yes, um, I don't think that there is any reason to believe. Um, oh, it's one of those multi phase quests where now I have to go to the farmhouses. I thought three was uh, too good to be true. Let me see, there should be another. Okay. Where is it? Ah, there it is. Okay. Come on, sniff out those traps now. Yeah, there's still more of them. Anyway, yeah, I, I don't see any reason to believe that Aragorn is, is expanding. Um, that the Dominion of Men means, at least in Aragorn's time, that, you know, the human king is going to establish a new kingdom. Where did... I lost Faroth. Where'd he go? Oh. Oh, good dog. You were fighting him for so long that he regened while his corpse was still lying there. How about we not stand here, Faroth, okay? Come help me find more, tra more traps, because I think there's another one over here. See? I needed you, Faroth. Anyway, yeah, so um, so I really, I myself strongly doubt that Aragorn was going to be expansionist in that way. It may seem, one could make an argument, right, that he is because of the wars in Harad and Umbar that are alluded to in the appendices. But see, there, I think, again, it's it's not so much a matter of, like, I'm going to expand my, you know, uh, my into an ever larger empire. Um, but instead, merely the fact that um, man, those orcs regen like crazy. And you keep distracting my dog. Knock it off. Trying to get him to sniff out traps. Um, what do you say? What do you say, Feral? Smell any orc traps around here? Yeah, where? Where is it? Where is it? Why is it not appearing? Is it over here? Oh, are you just smelling that orc? This is kind of a frustrating quest, I have to say, because I can't tell when I'm done with an area or not. I guess there are two other places where I can go, so let me just go to those. And I'll stop at the farm on the way. But it's just, the map suggests there are still more here. And they 
don't appear until something triggers them that I'm not 100% sure what it is. I mean, I think it's Faroth's proximity, so I'm trying to lure him to all the spots, but anyway, it's a little bit weird. Anyway, okay, so... So I don't think he's going to be... He's expanding. His wars with um, Harad and Umbar um, clearly have to do with, um, you know, the enmity and aggression of those places. Faroth. Oh, there you are. Okay. Man. The regen rate is insane on these guys. I see here also, it suggests there are still hidden traps. Right, I think it's the hidden orc that you're smelling. Faroth. In any case, as I say, I believe that the wars of Aragorn and Amir. Um, do not necessarily imply that, you know, Aragorn is just expanding his terrain. Um, and I keep think thinking that Evan Gleam is an orc trap. Am I getting closer, boy? No, I'm not apparently. Where's the hidden orc? It's like right here and not coming out of hiding to kill me. Hello, hidden orc. Oh, finally. And a trap. Why is he hiding over there? Yes, mopping up Sauron's servants and removing his influence from those regions would be part of it, I imagine. Yeah, me too. Me too. And as Tomas suggests, sitting down to discuss tax policy, which Aragorn just loves to do. As everybody knows. Boy, it's a good thing I didn't go out of my way to... Uh do this... Um Hey, what happened to it? My other quest, did it just auto-complete? My continued culling quest? Because it must have done. I didn't even notice. Okay, so I need hidden stable ruin orcs now. Let's see. Tomas says, One hopes that if he reconquers Mordor, he would take possession of Sauron's treasury, correct? Unless the whole thing blew up with Mount Doom. Well, most of it probably went down with Barad-dur. I would think. 
Uh oh. Oh yeah, is he over here? Yes, he is. Okay. Oh, now I have to go to the storehouse. Okay, fine. Can I just check to make sure? Yeah. Okay, so are you finding more hidden traps here? Are there more hidden traps, Pharaoh? Or just mushrooms? All right, fine. Well, let's just head up to the next one. What do we only need? I only need two more orchestra traps? They'll probably appear in the uh, these other places we haven't been to yet. So let's... Uh... Oh, it's that one that we're headed to. Have I been to that ruin down in the valley? I'm sure I must have. Ah, uh, Drow Snake suggests that the tax... Bo Whoa, what on earth is going on there? Geirgarch the Thirsty? Gross. Is that a roving threat? Yeah. Okay, Feroth, very stealthy now. Feroth. We're not here to play. No, thank you. Okay. Yes, here we are. At the um what is it? Storehouse, huh? I think I've done archaeology here before. All right, Farrath, if we could find both of our missing orc traps here, that would be awesome. But I think we have at least one orc in hide. Aha! Nice. And I think we've got at least one hidden orc right around here, too. Oh, there he is. Okay. Oh, anyway, Tomas, but I didn't... Oh, um, sorry, in a second. So, Carissa, um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question in just a second. <clears throat> Let me finish Tomas's or I'm going to forget. I, I'm so easily distracted. It's the final trap. Oh, yes, Faroth. Good dog. Um, so, Tomas, so the first answer, of course, is that, again, I, I don't think he's expansionist, and so there's no reason to think that he will impact others such as Erebor. However, um, what about the Shire? What about Bree? Because there we do have... Um, you know, some specific information, right? Um, I think that
Where'd he go? There it is. I think that the implication... So one of the main things that we're told about... Um, yeesh. Okay. To the merchant's shop, which I think is one of the ones we're missing anyway, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we're missing the merchant's shop. And the guard tower. Um, we are told explicitly that Aragorn decrees the sort of solidarity of the Shire. And not only does he make the Shire sort of politically autonomous. Okay, hang on. How are we going to get over this uh, little ridge here? Not only does he make the Shire politically autonomous from his control, but he... Um, you know, passes the law that none of the big people shall enter it, right? He makes it, uh, uh, you know, inviolate as well. Um, this is obviously and explicitly a special case. Like, for instance, it's explicitly clear he, he's not going to, like, forbid anybody from going into Bree, right? Um, it is exactly going to be better times for Bree, um, which sounds like a campaign slogan, doesn't it? Vote for Lessar. Better times for Bree. Um, but um, it's going to be better times for Bree because there will be more people coming and going. And and you'll remember... So, I mean, there's going to be an influx of people. Yeah, I've been here before. Wasn't I here? No, I guess I was just in a ruin just like it, wasn't I? I guess I haven't been here. Um, Butterbur expresses concern about an influx of strangers and people tearing up the wild country, right? Um, and we're assured, he is assured, right, that Elessar, the king, cares for Bree and wouldn't see that happen, right? Wouldn't let that happen. Um, but I certainly do not get the impression that he's promising that no, you know, outsider will ever come into Bree. What he's saying is he's not going to, he's not going to rip it up, right? He's not going to, um, they're not going to wreck the joint. You'll remember that, of course, what Butterbur is concerned about. They've just had all these ruffians come in, right? Um, where's the other hidden orc? Fair enough. Must be over here. Yeah, there he is. Um, so yeah, they've just uh, they've just had all these ruffians come up uh, from Isengard. At least this last one is back towards the where I'll be turning in these quests. Um, and he's worried about a repeat performance of the same situation. And so the idea that these people coming in are going to be under the authority of LSR and are going to, you know, behave themselves um, and not going to try to take over and not going to try to cause problems. You'll remember also that he, Butterbur, is reassured in being told that, um, you know, the waste places won't be waste any longer. See, there's a difference between tearing up the wild country, as Butterbur says, and um, transforming um, the, you know, crazy, spooky country up north that Butterbur is afraid of and that nobody in Bree dares to go near. Um, and turning that into, you know, friendly country. Um, he could have no objection to Deadman's Dyke being turned into um, 
you know, something. Oh, yes, we finished, Farah. Into a, you know, a civilized place. Um, yeah, JJ, I think that that's exactly the implication. Um, JJ says, it sounds like under a good king, we get the opposite of the desolation and wastes that we get under bad rulers. Yes, not only bad rulers, but just evil creatures, right? Evil creates wasteland and desolation around it, um, such as the wasteland we're in right now. Um, but even as we saw what was happening with Isengard and what we saw Saruman trying to do to the Shire, right? Um, that is... That is what bad rulers and uh, and evil creatures do. Um, but yes, Aragorn does the opposite, right? Good kings do the opposite. And they bring, just as they bring healing to individuals, they bring, you know, health and flourishing uh, to the land. Um, but he is... He is careful to... Um, he is careful to... Uh, uh, acknowledge the autonomy where autonomy is appropriate. We see I think three cases and all of them are a little bit different um, but there are some similarities too. I'm thinking of the case of the Shire, the case of the Druidon Forest, and the case of Bree. Right? In the case of the Shire, he uh they're still under his rule. Like, he deliberately includes them as part of the kingdom because he wants them to feel included, right? He doesn't want them to feel excluded. And yet he forbids anybody from going in. So he makes their land inviolate but included. Then there's the Druidon Forest, which he also says no man shall, en shall enter, right? So he makes that inviolate too, but he kind of makes it separate, right? Um, the message to the Druidon people seems to be we're like you're totally independent of us, which is not true of um, of the Shire. Their inclusion is a is a friendly gesture. It's not a political annexation, right? It's a friendly gesture, but but they are they are included. They are still his subjects. The Druidon, not obviously so, right? Bree is a third case then altogether, which where it seems that Bree is going to be part of the kingdom and will be under his authority and it will be part. I mean, it's it's going to just become part of the uh, of the empire. He still respects them. Um, he's you know, he's not going to come tromping in and changing everything. Um, but there will be changes. I mean, um, Gandalf could well have said if he had wanted to, uh, to Butterbur, what he said to the, you know, the the guards at the gates of Minas Tirith, you know, uh, for better or worse, the Brie that, you know, the Brie that you have known, uh, you know, is no more. Um, uh, it's coming to an end, right? Um, but, um, so basically Brie becomes a suburb. Well, not exactly a suburb because it's not like it's, he's building a whole new city nearby. Um, but um, it'll be, it'll still, I mean, Brie is still going to be important. It's always been important because it's right there at the crossroads. And that crossroads is now going to get a lot of use. So Butterbur is going to get a huge infusion of business. Um, he's going to quite like that. Right. There will be people coming and going up the green, up and down the greenway. That's, you know, we've said, and, you know, good people, law abiding people, not ruffians. Um, and some doubtless will come and settle near Bree and, and, and they will grow. But um, but again, in a in a happy way. Right. And not in a we're coming and taking over kind of way. Right. But the inclusion of Brie does seem to be the most thorough inclusion. And I think that we are being given a glimpse. Butterbur is being offered a glimpse of the new life of safety and prosperity that Brie will now enjoy. Remember Aragorn's statement, the Council of Elrond, um, that Butterbur, who I assume is the fat man that uh, uh, Aragorn is alluding to at the at the council, um, uh, that Butterbur lives a day's march from foes that would freeze his heart, right? The uh, the security, even the survival, you know, and lay his whole town in ruins, Aragorn goes on to add. Um, 
the security and even the survival of Bree is a more fragile thing than they have known, right? And what Gandalf is gent- gently implying there is that that security is going to be made permanent, right? When those monstrous threats, which they don't really know about, they have vague ideas. That's why they tell legends about things like Dead Man's Dyke, right? They're not, on the one hand, the kind of spook stories that they seem to have are probably wrong, um, you know, probably not based on truth, but they're also not totally incorrect either. Um, there are foes out there, apparently, that would freeze his heart and lay his town in ruins, um, and those will presumably be removed. Um, so um, anyway, that's... Um, uh, yes, and so J.J. exactly, combined with uh, Gandalf's enchantment on his beer, Butterbur stands to make out pretty well. Um, yes, 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 it does. Yes, it does. Um, so anyhow, that's... Um, it's it, the like political charter isn't isn't laid out, but those are the three scenarios that we really get. I mean, I guess Rohan, you could say as well as another one that we get um, another illustration of, you know, he's certainly not going to um, uh, not going to impinge on their sovereignty. In fact, the the thing that is mentioned that just gets kind of tossed out there. Right. Because it's it's not. It's not made a big deal of, but it's a bigger deal than it seems, I think, on the surface, is that Aemir and Aragorn re-swear the oath of Kyrian and Aeoril. That's a big deal. Um, it's a big deal because Kyrian was the steward. He didn't have the authority. I mean, you know, I mean, I, he's lord of the city and stuff and whatever, but... Um, when it was already an act of humility for Kyrian, the steward, when he originally swore the oath with Aeoril, right? Um, and he ceded to them Kalinarthen, which was a province of Gondor, so it was land under his authority, but it had been, um, you know, uh, uh, scarcely peopled, we're told. And so he cedes that, um, he gifts that uh, to Aeoril and acknowledges his sovereignty as a king and treats him not as a subject king, but as an ally. Right. Independent and an ally, um, which, again, that's an act of humility. That's a it's a major gift by uh, uh, by uh, uh, Kyrian, who's who's has a much, much, much greater authority than Aeoril right there. Um, Aragorn's choice to re-swear the oath of Aeoril, um, of Kyrian and Aeoril, is an even greater act of humility. Because he is now, he's king, and he's king over that land. Like That's part of the domains of Gondor, right? But he immediately reaffirms the gift. No, no, no. No, Gondor no longer makes any claim on the land of Kalinarthen, right? And again, he, Aragorn, as king, acknowledges the sovereignty, the independent sovereignty of Eomir as king of Rohan um, and makes an oath of uh, friendship, right, and allegiance with him. Um, so, um, uh, so yes, it's it's a bit that's that's a big deal, right? That's a um, a, a major thing. Um, as far as the other th- lands that are called, I mean, of course, I guess there are other examples that we have as well, which is Faramir in Ithilien. Right, that he's going to make Ithilien Faramir's princedom. Now, the fact that there are princedoms within Gondor, Dal Amroth, of course, we already know to be one. Prince Imrahil is called prince. Um, and I never understood this. You know, when I was a kid reading The Lord of the Rings, I remember my only context for the word prince was like the, you know, son of the king and, you know, like person in line for the throne. And so I, I was confused by princes. Uh, Imrahil. I'm like, if there's a prince, why why have they been looking at why didn't they just make him king? Seems the obvious thing to do, right? Um, but prince means more things than that, right? Um, and so I, I, it seems to me clear that the way that the word prince is being used um, is... So the, the word prince means ruler, right? So... Um, uh, this, they, they use this word a lot 
um, especially in the Renaissance in the 16th century, you can, um, uh, we, we, you know, you'll hear like, uh, you know, treatises on the rights of princes and things like that, which doesn't mean, it's, again, it's not talking about the heirs to the throne. It's talking about rulers, right? So the word prince used as a synonym for the word ruler um, is, um, uh, you know, princeps from the, from the Latin, basically, is what they were thinking, um, is... Um, uh, it, it's again, I say it becomes much more common, especially in the Renaissance. Um, so I think that he's using the word prince in those senses. Yes, a prince would be in charge of a principality. Um, uh, Guarin does. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I, um, I think that what that implies now, now there is no question in Prince Imrahil's mind that Aragorn is his king, right? And that Aragorn has sovereignty over him and his. So the relationship between Aragorn and Imrahil and therefore... I, I am assuming that Faramir being made Prince of Athelion is going to be sort of parallel to Imrahil, right? Um, and that seems to be, you know, part of this sort of tradition. It's, it's sort of established, right? That... Um, uh, this is how Gondor works, that there are separate princedoms and the king rules over them. And so there's a there is a sort of autonomy, like the authority of the prince within that prince within that principality would be real. Um, he, he would actually be the ruler of it. He is giving to Faramir the actual rule of Athelion. Um but he is going to be, you know, a subject ruler under him. So that Aragorn's relationship to Faramir and uh, Imrahil is quite different from his relationship to Aemir. Aemir is not a subject king. He's an ally. He's, a, he's, he's separate. Um, anyway, so the political situation is complicated. It, it, the princedom in that case, I, I do think of it, JJ, as more like... Um, uh, a duchy or a barony or something like that, um, where, you know, a duke does rule over, you know, they're, they're the lord over that section, of, but they are, you know, uh, the king is their liege um, and the king rules them. Um, that at least is certainly how Imrahil acts towards, I mean, Imrahil is the best example because we don't see Faramir and Aragorn interacting much after the princedom is given to him, right? Um, so, um, uh, anyway, yeah, that's... Um, uh, but as I say, with Imrahil, I, I see him acting... He seems to act very much like a duke would act, basically. Um, so I see those as, as basically sort of parallel. If anything, there is a little bit more um, authority that seems to be vested in the title of prince than, um, than would normally be uh, of, uh, of duke. But, okay. Anyway, Mabung, sorry. Leaving everybody hanging here. I thank you for your efforts, Griffa. Too many rangers have found themselves in peril because of those traps, Faroth included. Yep, we took care of it, finally. Good work, Griffot. I knew Faroth would prove invaluable, and I shall sleep easier without fear of orcs skulking right into our camp. But careful, though. They regen in like 20 seconds, Mablung. Seriously. Griffot, I have one last mission for you and Faroth. There exists an especially terrible warg in these lands, feared by man and orc alike. To them he is Mugwach, but we rangers call him the Stalker. He is known for stalking and toying with men for leagues before ultimately ambushing them and taking their life. Our attempt at hunting him down have our attempts at hunting him down have all failed. However, we did not have the keen nose of Faroth at our disposal. Go track down the stalker and end him for good. Okay. Well, that's kind of fun. Um. All right, Faroth. Let's do it. Let's hunt. I'll get stealthy, and you can sniff, and we'll see how that goes. Okay, now, while we're doing this, um, let me get back to Carissa, your question. Um, uh, your question was... Um,
What happened to the dwarven rings? Yes. Yes. Um, what happened to the dwarven rings? So, um, we're not told item by item. We're told that they had two categories of endings, right? Uh, we're, well, we're told first that they're not available, right? They're all definitely out of circulation. Oh, no, that's a millipede. That's not a footprint. Okay, Faroth, so are you going to, like, let me know? Okay, um, so we're told that one of two things happened to the uh, to the dwarf rings. One is Sauron got them back. Sauron put out the recall order on them. Aha. Sauron put out the recall order because um, they didn't work. At least they didn't work properly. They failed to wraithify the dwarves. Which was disappointing to Sauron. Um, it seems that um, unhappily, at least from his perspective. Oh, hi, Moogbach the Stalker. There you are. Right there. I only found a couple. Are you kidding me right now? I killed him, but I don't get credit for killing him because I only found three warg tracks. That is ridiculous. That is perfectly ridiculous. That is just a complete quest design fail, in my opinion. Especially when you make the tracks non-linear. Ridiculous. Fine. Well, it wasn't that hard to kill, anyway. Oh, now if only I could defeat Mogbach the Stalker. Okay. Anyway, um, so yes. Uh, some he has discovered and the others the dragons have consumed, Gandalf says. Um, the recall order, I've talked about that a lot before. Um, the dwarves were made to resist dominion, which seems to mean in this case they cannot be enslaved to Sauron's will. Even though the seven rings are corrupted. Hi, Mugbach the Stalker. Um, even though the rings are corrupted um, and therefore can have, you know, some negative impacts on uh, the dwarves who wield them, they are um, still potentially sort of a net gain uh, for um, 
for the dwarves, which is why Sauron recalls them. So he tries to recollect all of the seven rings, but he fails because apparently some of them have been, quote, consumed by dragons. Um, this I find the most tantalizing of the references to the fates of it. Like, what dragons? And yeah, so, um, uh, yes, no, dra no dwarf wraiths. Dwarves don't get wraithified. Um, can't happen, we're told. Because Aule, uh, Aule thought of that, <laughs> basically. Um, that's, that's how Aule made them, apparently. At last the stalker is dead. On behalf of the rangers of Athelion, thank you. We can rest easier knowing we are no longer being hunted by that fiend. Oh, good. You two have completed all the work I have for you this day. Faroth has proved himself quite capable, hasn't he? He deserves some praise. Oh, who's a good dog? Who's a good dog? Um, do I have the pat emote? Yes, okay. Yes. Faroth looks up at you happily. He seems to enjoy life as a ranger hound. Goodbye, Faroth. Excellent ranging. <laughs> I don't think a ranger has actually ever used that verb before. The new man lands and the host of the West are safer for your actions. And of course, we must thank Faroth. You two seem to have quite the bond. Would you care to take him with you? I am certain he would make an excellent adventuring companion. <gasps> the Tome of Faroth? You've decided to take Faroth on your adventures to the wastes and beyond. Um. Okay. Is it is is Faroth a cosmetic pet? Okay. Grifflet, Anborn, and a handful of others have moved ahead to Hyrandir, our fort in the No Man Lands. You can see it from here. It is the large ruin to the north. They will likely need any help you can spare, preparing for the march into enemy territory. Aha, uh -huh. just what I expected. Sent to a new quest giver in Hyrandir. Okay. Hello there, new Faroth. I have to admit, I um, I find the idea of a dog that large kind of strange. Uh, you know, seems weird to me, but you know, I say that because I have a Shih Tzu who's ten pounds, so you know, that's uh, in my household the appropriate size of dog. So. No, Phil, he's huge. That's the point. Um, <laughs> a, dog, a, a dog of uh, uh, even what is called a medium-sized dog <laughs> is pretty big <laughs> in my experience. Um, I, I've met Great Danes. Yeah, no, they're very large, but even like retrievers and Labradors are enormous to me. Um, yeah, yeah. No, that's all I'm saying. Okay, here we are at our new quest center. So we have now completed. So I'm assuming that here in the wastes, it looks like there are three different quest centers. Um, uh, the um, the camp, which we're now finished with, North of, um, um, Hyrondir here, and the Slag Hills. I assume is the is the third. Um, yeah, yeah three primary ones. So, um, hang on, is this one of my ruins over here? Does 
Does this count as a separate run? No, it doesn't seem to be identifying it as a separate run. Okay. Okay. Anyway, we are making pr progress here in Daggerlad. We have arrived at Hyrondir. The first thing we're going to do is use the milestone. Sickly light plays over the stones of Hyrondir, and the air smells foul. I bet it does. Okay, there's long loss. This is a dead place, an empty place. I do not like it. There will be many places such as these as we get nearer to Mordor, Griffith. How could anyone live here? The answer to that question is a simple one, I suppose. No one does live here, not truly. Not good folk, at any rate. I have heard tell from the rangers of Athelion that there are a few sites throughout the wastes in which evil folk dwell. These places should be scouted before the host passes near. Find Dum Boha in the No Man Lands, and Dol Acharn, and Ondaher's Folly in Dagorlad, and defeat any enemies that may endanger the passage of the host. Once the way is safe, the host of the West will assemble outside the Black Gate, and we will see what awaits us there. Okay, well, all right, find Dumboha, find the road to Dol, Dol Ar Acharn, uh, find Ondaher's Folly, defeat foes. Okay. That seems pretty general. Let me get my other quests. We go upstairs here, Faroth. So, um, Carissa, I was um, thinking about um, the dragons, the dwarf rings, right? I don't know which dragons consumed the rings um, or why consumed makes it sound like they ate them for a light snack right and I assume that that's not in fact what happened um, that they were destroyed by dragon fire um, Gandalf brings this up as an example for how rings of power can be destroyed though he thinks that um, you know there was never any dragon who's in whom the fire burned hot enough to destroy the one ring However, the Seven Rings, yep, that's possible. Um, so what the, the picture that we're given there is that fighting against dragons was a thing that happened among the dwarves. And that, um, uh, you know, this, this, this was, these were not unknown, essentially. Um, yeah, he does mention in Caligon the Black... But he mentions Ancalagon the Black, saying not even Ancalagon the Black. Ancalagon the Black was the greatest dragon of all time. The biggest, baddest dragon of all time. Not the original. Glaurung was, um, you know, the father of all dragons. But Ancalagon the Black is the one that Eärendil killed in the War of Wrath. Um, Ancalagon the Black is described as being huge. Not as huge. People exaggerate. The People misunderstand... Um, Tolkien's kind of poetic language. Um, that is, he's described, and Caligon the, is described as like breaking the mountains when he falls. And so some have taken this uh, as meaning that Caligon must have been like the size of a mountain range. And that's not true. Um, it's poetic language that he's using when he's describing the fall of Ancalagon. Um, uh, but he's huge. Like, Gandalf says he's the biggest dragon ever. Uh, so, uh, but not even Encalagon could destroy the One Ring. Um, yeah, Edith, exactly. The Balrog also broke the mountain when he fell. That doesn't mean he was big enough to smush the mountain when he fell. Exactly. Um, but, um, yeah, so, uh, anyway, yeah, I, I think that you'll notice, of course, that Lotro has picked up on this implication uh, quite freely, right? Think about the dragon in um, Enidwyth, isn't it Enidwyth, right? Where the where um, Thor 
was staying before, right? Um, that there would that there's a dragon nearby there makes all kinds of sense. Think about the dragon in um, um, up in the up in the Misty Mountains. That raid up there. Um, yeah, yeah, Drygoch, exactly. Um, again, like. That also was a dwarf place where there was a dragon also. So the game has uh, picked up on the fact that, and of course it makes perfect sense the more that you think about it, that that uh, dwarves and dragons um, are natural enemies or rather um, competitors for resources, right? That is both dragons and dwarves are natural treasure collectors. Um, obviously, this is established in with Smaug and Erebor, right? But it's, but it's that same idea, right? That uh, dwarves and dragons share a love of treasure. And so naturally, um, when dwarves assemble large treasures, it's going to attract dragons like Smaug. And when dragons have treasures, it's going to attack, attract dwarves as well. So it's very natural. Now, it's tr I think that Smaug was really there for the toys, the toy market of Dale. That is my own little private theory. Um, but, um, but still, I mean, you know, the wealth of Thror was a nice bonus for him as well. Um, but... Um, yeah, exactly. Where dragons dwell is the tagline for Arid Mithrin. Yes, yes. And the 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 wastes, um, the withered heath up in the north where the dragons came from is also where there are dwarves as well. So there's lots of opportunity for conflict between dwarves and dragons, but we get very few of those stories. Um, so it's one of those, that reference, you know, just that one um, phrase in Gandalf's sentence, um, the others the dragons have consumed. It's a clause, I suppose. Uh, that one clause in Gandalf's sentence, the others the dragons have consumed, contains, like, a whole wealth of completely untold stories uh, in The Lord of the Rings. I think that's really fun. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, oh, well, yes, there's the Near Nithar Nordiad where the uh, Dwarf King dies killing a dragon, though that was in different contexts. But, yeah, um, the point, Phil, exactly as you imply there, is that the um, the enmity, the tradition of dwarves and dragons fighting each other goes way back, right? Um, Smaug and Erebor is one of the, you know, origins of the Middle Earth story. Lord of the Rings, of course, is a sequel to The Hobbit originally. And, um, uh, and then, of course, when you go backwards in history, you see that dwarves and uh, dragons fighting together is also a part of that older story as well. So, yep, yep, that animosity is there. But again, very few of those stories told, and none of them, none of the stories of, like, other holders of the seven dwarf rings whose rings were destroyed in dragon fire. Um, yeah. Yeah, but exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, Glistern Mist. That's a really fun name. Um, uh, they they both like the shinies. That's the core of the problem there. Ah, Griffith, good to see you. I take it Mablung sent you our way. We can surely use the assistance. Thanks, Anborn. Ooh, okay. This is the center of people who need assistance, apparently. We found an orc camp not far from here in the ruins of Nuharn. Yeah, I found that one too, I think. They do not appear to be making a move toward the camp of the host, but it would be unwise to let them linger nearby. The last thing we need is to be ambushed on the road or flanked from the rear while we march to the Black Gate. We have learned that the orc captain Blagloch, Blogloch leads this camp. Head to Nuharn and end this threat. Okay, I kind of, uh, uh, I was doing a little pre-gaming on that one, Anborn, but I can go back. That is, if I'm remembering correctly, isn't is this Nuharn? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's where I was. That's where I started today, actually. Um. Okay. Uh, who's this? Gla Glavier, Glavier, presumably. Glavier. Griffith, it is good to have you here with us on the doorstep of the enemy. After you left us, Gilead, the other rangers and I had little difficulty finding and defeating the last orcs hiding amongst the city ruins. Now then, to the matter at hand. As you may have heard, the enemy does not venture into the ruins of Hyrondir, for they believe it haunted. 
In truth, this is not the case. It is an appearance we have kept up so that we may occupy this most northern lookout for Gondor undisturbed. Oh, so you guys have always been here. Okay. Now then, to the matter at hand. As you may have heard, the enemy does not venture into the ruins of Hyrondir, for they believe it haunted. In truth, I already said this. Okay, sorry. Not long ago, Haradrim set up camp just over the western hills. We have noticed their patrols widen each, as each day passes. While we have been able to trick the orcs for many years, I fear the Haradrim are shrewder foes. We must stop this camp from spreading and uncovering the truth about Hyrondir. Would you take on this task while we guard the western gate from assault? Okay, oh boy. All of their uh, tasks are of the enter this place where you will presumably get a whole handful of quests variety. Uh, who's this? Mindal. I have a favor to ask of you, my friend. One of our own, Lagla, has set out to scout the hill of Ondahir's folly. He fears a company of orcs lie, lay in wait and seek to... Should they be lying in wait? Yeah, they really should. Lie in wait and seek to encircle the host as it draws closer to the Black Gate. Lyglaw was firm in his desire to scout the hill, but these lands are hostile to us all. We cannot risk scouting alone any longer, for the enemy's forces may be arrayed against us just out of sight. Thus I bid the ranger Mincham, Mincham accompany him in his patrol. Griflet, I know that you and the ranger have crossed paths many times, and I trust that he shall be of aid to Lyglaw, especially with his knowledge of the enemy's language. Patience also seems to be a virtue of his as a lore master of sorts, named Artemir, begged to follow him out to Ondahir's folly, and he was gracious enough to escort the fellow there. The man is no warrior, and it troubles me that he might endanger their cause through carelessness. Oh man, boy, this is getting better and better. As far as I know, they have traveled to ruins due north of here. The ruins are known as Tom Durlan, but with so little left intact, it is difficult to tell them from any other. Meet them there, and aid Lagla and Mincham if you are able, and keep a close watch on Artemir for me. Artemir. Do I know that guy? Have I met him before? It is interesting, the suggestion that orcs are superstitious and sub suggestible, um, more so than the Haradrim. I think the implication is that they're dumber, basically. Artemir was in the Dead Marshes, Drowsnake. Thank you. I thought I'd run into him. So he was the scholar who was doing research in the Dead Marshes. Okay. All right, so I don't think there's anything else up here, really. Can I go inside there? No. Just kind of looking around. Man. Hey, look. Teladon and O'Row here. They found a new vantage point to stand out and stare. Hey, guys. What are we looking at? Mmm, out towards the Slag Hills, huh? Who's this? Who's the peering fellow? Oh, he's just peering fellow, apparently. I can't click an L down an L row here. Oh, yes, I can. Okay. All right. Can't get up into the keep, huh? All right, fine. Okay, what time is it? Ah, we still got time. Ooh, what's down at Narhast? Enemies to kill, presumably? I'm looking for uh, Doom Bone. Yeah, I'll go there. Dalak Harn, yeah. Onto here's folly and foes. Okay. Dalakharn, onto here's folly. Where's Doom Boha? Uh, Bane of the Serpent. 
Oh, that's the one that's over there by Narchast. Okay. I see. Narchast itself is actually down here. And the, okay, so it's in the direction, but it's not. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, all right. I will head I think I'll go back to where I came from first. Let's do these clockwise, I guess. Okay. All right. The dwork, the orcs' superstitions sound a bit like Butterbur. Um, uh, sort of. Sort of. Um, I mean, of course, we remember that we were just involved. You know, Grifflet just did this, like, sneaking up on orcs and yelling to scare them away, right, is a thing. I mean, we just were on that quest. So they're sort of... Um, the quests have been really drawing attention to the tendency uh, of orcs to be easily frightened, which is interesting. Um, I mean, it is an interesting choice. That they would be stupid makes all kinds of sense, because uh, Sauron... What Sauron and Morgoth both valued in their servants was absolute obedience. They did not really want independent thinkers. Um, so they, there are some orc captains and such. Um, so it's not like all of them can be dumb as posts. But um, but their problems when they're not... I mean, look at Grishnak. Grishnak is, you know, immediately setting up for himself, right? He's a problem. Um, and that's exactly the sort of problem that, you know, is all too likely to come from intelligent servants. So you got to be careful about this sort of thing if you're the Dark Lord. Um, and, um, okay, I'm supposed to enter here, and then I'm going to have to, like, presumably collect a bunch of landscape quests, so... All right, no, there we go. Defeat orcs and defeat Bloglock. That's all, huh? Okay. Did I find Bloglock up here? I forgot. There he is. Pretty sure I already accidentally defeated this guy earlier on. So I'm going to ditch this captain. And now I've got Blonk Blonk. One on one. Why can I not stun him? Oh, well, no need. Okay, simple enough. Great, how many is that? Eight? Yeah, I think so. No problem. Okay. 
Okay, there's 10. Yeah, I was pretty sure I killed him last week. Just need the one more. Oh, I guess I don't need one more. Yes, I did. Oh, it's right. It's the 14 foes. Okay. Sorry, I was confused there for a second. Okay, no problem. Um, let's go find Ligo then, as he's next geographically. What am I looking at? I'm looking at Onda Hare's Folly up there. Hey, look, it's another ruin. Maybe it will be one of my ruins I need for that deed. Right, yeah, he was sitting next to one of the uh, archaeology things. Again, not the greatest quest design, right? Like, it's very unlikely that I would have gotten that quest from Hyromdir. Um... At this, you know, because I get the archaeology one right away. Well, you know, whatever. One can hardly object to slaying Bloglock twice. Okay. Tom Durlan, which is one of my ruins. Oh, look at that. The guard tower. I think that's this one. I can see a ruin on the map that I haven't been to yet. Oh, there we go. Okay, Ligo. What do you think? Grifflet, keep your head low. And, oh, I, I meant no offense, my friend. My head's already low. My head's always low. Let us speak swiftly and quietly about what is to be done about the orcs nearby. I have not come alone, but Minkham and I cannot defend against their numbers. As for the Loremaster, Artemir does not even have a weapon to wield. He imagines some sort of careless expedition, I think. I hope he realizes his folly soon, and but not by an orcish blade. Most of their forces are gathered up ahead upon the hill of Ondahir's folly, but a small outpost lies to the northeast just over this ridge. We know little of their intent, but I worry they aim to endanger the host of the west before it reaches the Black Gate, even if their master wishes otherwise. We must learn more of their purpose at Ondahir's Folly, but I shall not risk a direct attack until we know more. Travel to their outpost and see if you can discover anything from the orcs encamped there. Okay. Hmm. All right. So we have the most recent accretions of, like, orc barricades and skull posts and things, right? Underneath that is the big, huge cupola in the middle. You know, that little, like, what looks like a shrine in the middle there. That has black spiky things on it which are probably accretions over a Gondorian monument built. So I, I'm assuming this is a Gondorian monument and then it was made evil, right, with like black spiky bits uh, by, you know, Sauron's redecoration squad and then the orcs came and settled their camp. So I'm assuming that we'll be able to see evidence of all three layers of the uh, the life of the monument to Andahir's Folly. Uh, 
Okay, so JJ says, could orcs being superstitious help us reconcile goblins being described as clever inventors in The Hobbit and easily directed minions in much of the rest of Tolkien's Middle-earth? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So um, it is true that there is a kind of um, a kind of irony, a kind of conflict, right? When Tolkien was... Um, What, what am I supposed to do? Interrogate them? Eavesdrop? Oh, search them for orders. Slay them and loot the bodies. Okay. Um, when Tolkien was writing The Hobbit, he was, and I've talked about this on many different occasions, but um, when Tolkien was writing The Hobbit, he was not writing it was not initially in can I get up there can I just encourage him to come down and chase me oh good yes I can Um, yeah, anyway, so when Tolkien wrote The Hobbit, it's easy to kind of go into The Hobbit with the assumption that, you know, since chronologically, it, in Tolkien's life chronologically, I mean, it comes after um, the Silmarillion material and contains apparent references to several item elements of the Silmarillion, Elrond, Gondolin, etc., that it's consistent with it, like that Tolkien intended it um, to be part of that world, that he was, he was, you know, writing about that consistently. As I've explained many times before, I don't believe this to be the case at all. I think it's pretty clear that he was writing The Hobbit as a standalone fairy tale and that he... Um, oh, sorry. My stealth was still on cooldown. Forgot about that. Um, yeah, that he was that he was writing it as a standalone fairy tale. I think that his dominant influence in writing The Hobbit, that is, in doing the goblins in The Hobbit, one of the reasons that he used the word goblin instead of orc uh, to describe them, is that he was appealing to. Um, established fairy tale traditions. Most importantly, uh, George MacDonald's um, Curdy stories. Um, the Princess and the Goblin, for instance, if you know The Princess and the Goblin. Um, and the goblins in The Hobbit are quite a lot like the goblins in George MacDonald. Um... Gotta get them to come chase me again. Slappy feet and all. Yes, absolutely. So, um, I'm not, am I missing something? None of the orc bodies have been glowy. So, I don't, I'm just assuming that I haven't yet killed the right orc. Yeah, their feet are vulnerable. They have soft, flappy feet. So in um, Curdy, where's uh, Curdy is a guy, is a kid, uh, and he. Oh no! You got to be kidding me! It wouldn't be in the loot bag. Yeah, don't scare me like that. What is this? Metal scrap. Oh, it's a, the reputation items? I thought we were done with those. Um, except for the queen of the goblins who wears stone shoes. Yes, exactly. So anyway, Curdy, like when to fight goblins, he just goes around and literally stomps their feet. Um, he's got his boots. 
and they all have these big flat flappy, flappy feet. By the way, even the foot of the troll, um, Frodo stabbing the foot of the cave troll, um, is a memory of George MacDonald as well. Um, anyway, so I am making no progress here. Finally. We have nearly exhausted our supply of Gondorian prisoners, but I have heard tell that a great force of men approaches from the southwest. Capture any that draw too close and make ready to deliver them to Faltor Sheik. After you have claimed those men, return to Mordor and gather any weak or elderly Nurnhoth you can find. Promise them freedom from their shackles, but instead deliver them to me upon the Hill of Sacrifice. Love and Smooches, the blood letter. Um. Wait, what? Okay, new sacrifices. So they're the hill of sacrifice. So is that what that's what they're using the monument for? The repurposed monument. Okay. Um, anyhow, okay, so, but back, JJ, back to your larger point. Um, in following George MacDonald, um, and with George MacDonald, this sort of general, um, you know, fairy tale tradition about goblins, um, Tolkien makes the, the goblins, his goblins in, um, He makes his goblins in The Hobbit clever and inventive, even, right? They invented, like, nuclear bombs and stuff. Um, but, um, but then when he returns to world building that is consistent with the Silmarillion, when he works that out, as he works that out, I should say, during the course of The Lord of the Rings, he returns to making the orcs dominantly um, dull-witted, and under the dominion of Sauron, instead of independent and, and witty um, and inventive and clever. Um, so there is a little bit of a, a, a sort of contradiction here. So, JJ, thinking back to the point that you're making about orcs being superstitious, does it help us to, uh, to kind of reconcile them in some way? Um, well, it is interesting because superstition implies... Uh, a, a certain kind of like there are a couple things that you need in order to be superstitious one you need to be able to perceive patterns like when I do this thing this other thing happens but the kind of superstition the, uh, like being afraid of ghosts right requires a certain amount of imagination as well um uh you know if you're hearing sounds and you believe that the place is haunted um one way, the way that it seems to me they're implying that that gets accomplished with the orcs is that they are A, stupid, but B, imaginative, right? They are willing to imagine, um, you know, spooks and things. Um, gullibility, yeah, exactly. That That's, I think, where the lack of intelligence comes in. Um, but um, But as I say, imaginative as well. If they're not imaginative, they're not going to imagine ghosts. They're going to imagine, what, animals or something else? Like, they're just going to go and investigate, right? But to hear a mysterious sound and think, this must be spirits. Now, if you live near Mordor, where there are, in fact, evil spirits living all over the place, it requires perhaps less imagination. But still, there is an active imagination involved there. Um... So in some ways, perhaps that's some kind of a bridge, but I don't really see a direct bridge. Um, I think the clearest bridge, JJ, that Lotro has tried to build between the orcs of uh, the Lord of the Rings and the goblins of the um, of the Hobbit are those goblins that run around with pots of fire on their heads, right, um, and chuck them at you. Those, I think, are like designed to be the bridge between 
uh, to back to the hobbit goblins that like to blow things up. What have you learned of the orc's plans, Griffith? Were you able to recover any orders from them? You show Lyglaw the orders, but his face twists in concentration when he sees the phrase in the black speech. Our foes to the north are great in number as we expected, but I am left with more questions. The identity of this blood letter is unknown to us. They also have many unfortunate prisoners in their keeping, but we do not know what or where this Faltor Sheik could be. It troubles me, my friend. Much of this writing is in Westron. For what purpose is a single phrase in the tongue of the orcs? I assume that bringing alone a lore master such as bringing along, sorry, a lore master such as Artemir ought, might have been a, a, a great help to us for such a chance find. But the man seems repulsed at the mere mention of the black speech. The poor fellow should have stayed back at Harandir. It seems Mindal was wise to ask for Mincham's aid after all. The ranger is well learned in the languages of the enemy. Bring this missive to Mincham and see what he can make of it. Okay. What is he keeping his distance over here? He decided to keep the bear company instead. Hey, Mincham. What is this missive you bear? You explain to Mingham that you have need of his knowledge of the black speech once more. He takes the orders from you and begins to read it. When he reaches the phrase in the black speech, he suddenly halts. By my reading of these orders, I understand Ondahir's folly and Faltor's Sheik to be the very same, and it seems the orcs have made something far worse of that hill than a mere strategic holding. That phrase, Faltor Sheik, it means the feign of screaming. Really? Feign of screaming? Feign is such a wonderful English word. Um, a fane means an altar or a sacred place, like a shrine. Um, though usually uh, the kind of connotation of the word is that it's um, uh, like you wouldn't call, usually you wouldn't call like a, a shrine set up in the middle of a city, like at a, you know, like at a, at a church or something, a fane. Um, a fane would be like, a, you remember in um, Ithilien, when Sam discovers that altar, right, with the blood on it um, and the bones, uh, and he knew that like, some hideous rite had taken place there, right? That's a fane. That's an evil fane, right? And they're not always necessarily evil. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, anyway, that's... Um, but yeah, that's 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 an example of a fane, um, like a druidic shrine or something like that out in the middle of the forest would be a fane. Um, yeah. OK. Anyway, let's see. Uh -huh. uh, the fane of screaming. Huh. Such a name. It affords new significance to the grim structures that tower over the hill. It is not merely an orcish encampment, my friend, but a temple of slaughter. Cool. The fane of screaming. What a vile place, vile name for a place of such sorrow for the people of Gondor. I have heard tales told by Aragorn of the king of old, Undaher, and the fate that traveled far to meet him in these lands. I believe that is a tale better told by Artemir, and in less pressing times. Suffice it to say, a king of Numenorean blood laid low by the enemy's servants is not soon to be forgotten. They have twisted the loss of Gondor into a monument to their own master. It is clear that these orcs have defiled the hill, and I fear many of the Dark Lord's prisoners have met their end on its summit, and without the mercy of a swift death. Even in wartime, and with a great battle looming, I cannot abandon those that still remain to such a fate. I could not forgive myself for turning away from their pain, Griffith, and I believe Aragorn would consider this the proper course as well. Travel to Ondahir's Folly, and free all of the prisoners you can find. I shall keep watch for your return. Okay. I will be looking for tortured captives. Hang on. Is that... Tell me that... Oh, no, this is Lung, Lung Law again. Yeah. Liglaw. Sorry. What did the ranger make of that missive? You inform Liglaw that Falthor Sheik translates to the feign of screaming and what Mienkam takes that to mean. His face is aghast for a moment, but he is able to summon his words once more. The fane of screaming. Is this truly the name they have bestowed upon the site of our king's fall? If the orcs sought to provoke us through insults, I shall let them consider this a victory, but it will be their last. 
It has been long since we moved against the orcs in the wastes directly, and I believe it likely an assault which would catch them by surprise. I no longer doubt your place among the rangers, my friend, for you have done much to aid my company, and I trust you would do so again. For the sake of our king's memory and for the fallen, ride to Underhair's folly and put an end to, the, to those orcs. Okay. Okay. Um... All I have to do is defeat orcs there. And free captives, obviously. Yeah, interesting. He uses the word feign to describe... Um, well, no. He says... Um, okay, right. Um, JJ was doing a search for feign. Um, this is in the... Uh, this is in the Akalabeth, right? In the midst of the land was a mountain tall and steep, and it was named the Menaltarma, the Pillar of Heaven, and upon it was a high place that was hallowed to Eru Iluvatar, and it was open and unroofed, and no other temple or fane was there in the land of the Numenorians. Yeah, so I think, JJ, um, the implication there is he says temple or fane, I think to cover all the bases. Like, there is no other sacred place. Um sacred spot of worship in all of Numenor. Um, so when he says temple or fane, like a temple is what you'd expect to find in a city, a fane is what you would expect to find in the wilderness, right? Like a woodland shrine. Um, so yeah, I think that that's... Um, yeah. Oh yeah, fane is totally a Tolkien word. Um, not only is it, um, uh, is it definitely in... Um, I knew he used it somewhere. And I think there might be somewhere else. Maybe it's in one of the older versions. Maybe it's in History of Middle-earth or something. Oh, man, another roving threat wandering about. Mars Gurud. Just like a wonking big, what is it, a troll? Um... Yeah, JJ says, uh, not talking specific, but is this like what the Old Testament called high places? And so it's complicated. Most worship was done in high places in the, you know, the ancient Middle East. Um, and we see that all over the place. So, um, uh, but, like, shrines that were built you know, two pagan deities in high places would certainly have been what in old English a fane is a is a is a it's an Anglo Saxon word as I recall. Um and um it uh it's so I mean the Anglo Saxons would have called those fanes, I'm sure. But um yeah. Ooh, time check. Thank you, Hologro. You are so right. I don't have time blithely to uh waltz into uh the feign of screaming here. But, um... Ah. Fascinating. Okay. Sorry, fascinating because it looks like this is all evil. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any Gondorian memorial to Andahir at the middle of it, or if it was just erased. Anyway, we'll see. Okay, okay. Um... Yeah. Anyway, fane is a really good old English word, I think, is if I'm recalling correctly. So, all right. Um, I should go. However, I don't want to uh, impinge upon Druid's fire's time. Uh, so, um, aha. Yeah, I thought I remember remembered it elsewhere. Courtierian among the trees uh, in the poem. The seven candles of the silver wane like lighted tapers in a darkened fane now flare above the fallen year. Yes, yes. Um, yep, yeah. No, it's it's definitely it's definitely a Tolkien word. It's not a common word. He doesn't use it in the Lord of the Rings, but um, it is uh, it is definitely definitely there. Um, yes, Druid's Fire. Uh, the Mythmoot uh, are the sightseeing trip to Umbar which I'm very much looking forward to. Our Mythmoot stream is going to be streamed on the uh, Signum University uh, uh, Twitch channel. So you can join us there on Thursday evening. Uh, Druid's Fire might be able to look up the time. I forget the time. Um, Thursday evening, 
um, on the uh, on twitch.tv slash signumu if you would like to join us for that. Um, otherwise, I will be back in a fortnight. I, I was just checking to make sure that was true. Yes, it is true. I will be here in a fortnight, um, and then I'll be gone again. Um, so I'm going to be, my stream is going to be fortnightly uh, for a couple weeks in a row, a couple a couple times in a row here. Um, but um, yeah. Yeah, random deal. Uh, I, I Yes, I think it, it, it is the word of the, the root of profane. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, yeah, anyway, um, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks everybody for joining me. Uh, uh, you can, uh, join in again next week on Thursday evening. I believe it's going to be 9 PM. Thank you. 9 PM Eastern time on thir next Thursday. I'll be doing my, uh, my Umbar sightseeing trip and, um, uh, but there'll be no Grifflet on Friday, but I will be back two weeks from today. Meanwhile, stay tuned for Druid's Fire. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Thanks for joining in on my rambles around Standing Stone's brilliant digital adaptation of Tolkien's world. If you enjoy these adventures, please consider supporting this and other entertaining educational programming by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.